that. In fact, it plots them very accurately. Uh, but uh, uh, it's something uh, you also need to learn to do yourself. Uh, as you'll see when we study nonlinear equations, it's a skill. And since some, a couple of important mathematical ideas are involved in it, I think it's a very good thing to spend some, a little, just a little time on. One lecture, in fact. Uh, plus a little more on the problem set that I'll give you out on, the last problem set I'll give you out on Friday. <clears throat> so, I thought uh, it might be a little more fun to, again, have a simple-minded model. Uh, uh, no romance this time. Uh, we're going to have a, a little model of war, but I, I, I made it a sort of a sub, sublimated war. So. Uh, Let's take as the uh, system, I'm going to let two of those be parameters, you know, be variable in other words, and the other two I'll keep fixed so that you can concentrate on them better. So I'll take A and D to be negative 1 and negative 3. And the other ones we'll leave open, so let's call this one B times X, uh, B times Y. And this, the other one, will be uh, C times uh, X. Okay, uh, I'm going to model this as uh, um, a fight between two states, both of which are trying to attract tourists. Uh, so let's say this is uh, Massachusetts, and uh, this will be Massachusetts, and this will be uh, New Hampshire, its enemy to the north. Both are busy advertising these days on television, you know, people are making their summer plans. <laughs> Come to New Hampshire, you know, the mountain, New Hampshire has mountains and Massachusetts has quaint little fishing villages and stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so what are these numbers? Well, I'm going to, first of all, what do X and Y represent? Now, X and Y basically are the advertising budgets uh, for tourism. You know, what, the amount each state plans to spend during the year. Uh, however, I don't want zero value to mean they're not spending anything. It represents departure from the normal equilibrium. So X equal and Y are represent departures from the normal advertising, normal tour, the normal amount of money they spend on tourists advertising for tourists, the normal tourist advertising budget. So if they're both zero, it means that both states are spending what they normally spend in that year. Uh, if X is positive, it means Massachusetts has decided to spend more in the hope of attracting more tourists. And if it's negative, then uh, it's spending less. Now, what is the significance of these two coefficients? Uh, those are the normal things which return you to equilibrium. In other words, if X gets bigger than normal, if Massachusetts spend more, uh, there's a certain pull to spend less uh, because, you know, we're wasting all this money on the tourists that aren't going to come and we could be spending it on education or something like that. Uh, if X gets to be negative, the governor tries to spend less, uh, then all the ch local uh, city chambers of commerce rise up and start screaming that, you know, our economies are going to go bankrupt because we won't get enough tourists and that's because you're not spending enough money. So there's a push to, to always return it to the normal, and that's what this negative sign means. The same thing for uh, New Hampshire. What does it mean that it's, this is negative three and that's negative one? It just means that the Chamber of Commerce is, uh, 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 yell three times as loudly in New Hampshire, and uh, you know it's more sensitive, in other words, to changes in the budget. Now, how about the other? Well, these represent the warlike features of the situation. Uh, normally, these will be positive numbers because 
when Massachusetts sees that New Hampshire is spending this year more than it has budgeted more than its normal amount, the natural instinct is of, hey, we're fighting. This is war. Uh, this is a positive number. We got to budget more too. And the same thing for New Hampshire. So the size of these coefficients it gives you the magnitude of the reaction. If, if they're small, Massachusetts says, well, they're spending more, but you know, we don't have to follow them. We'll you know, up it a little bit. Uh, if it's a big number, then oh my god, you know, heads will roll. We have to triple them and put them out of business. This is a model, for, in fact, for all sorts of competition. It's, it was used for many years to model, uh, in simpler times, uh, armaments races between countries. Uh, it's certainly uh, a simple-minded model for any two companies in, in competition with each other if certain conditions are met. Uh, all right. Um, well, what I'm trying to do now is uh, try different values of those numbers and in each case show you how to show, show you how to uh, don't, don't, uh, uh, sketch the solutions at different cases and then we'll try to as for each different case we'll try to interpret uh, you know if it makes sense or not okay so my first set of numbers is the first case is uh, <clears throat> X prime equals negative 1, negative X, uh, plus 2Y, and Y prime equals, this is going to be 0, so it's simply minus 3 times Y. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that Massachusetts is behaving normally, but New Hampshire is, is a, a very placid state. The governor is, uh, you know, is, I don't know, busy doing other things. And uh, people say, hey, Massachusetts is spending more this year. And the, government's, the governor says, so what? The zero is the so what factor. In other words, we're not going to respond to them. We'll do our own thing. OK, what's the result of this? Is Massachusetts going to win out? Uh, what's going to be the ultimate effect on the budgets? Well, uh, what we have to do is let's, so the program is first, uh, let's quickly solve the equations using a standard technique. So I'm just going to make marks on the board and trust to the fact that you've done enough of this yourself by now that you know what the marks mean. I'm not going to label what everything is. I'm just going to trust to luck. So uh, the matrix A is negative 1, 2, 0, 3, negative 3. The characteristic equation is the second coefficient is the trace, which is minus 4, but you have to change its sign. So that makes it plus 4. And the constant term is the determinant, which is 3 minus 0. So that's plus 3 equals 0. This factor is into lambda plus 3 times lambda plus 1. And it means the roots, therefore, are one root is lambda equals negative 3 and the other root is lambda equals negative 1. These are the eigenvalues. With each eigenvalue goes an eigenvector. So the eigenvector is found by solving an equation for the coefficients of the eigenvector, the components of the eigenvector. Uh, it's, uh, here I use minus negative 1 minus negative 3. That makes 2. So the first equation is 2a1 plus 2a2 is equal to 0. Uh, the second one uh, will be, in fact, in this case, simply 0a1 plus 0a2. So it won't give me any information at all. It's not, that's not what usually happens, but it's what happens in this case. So what's the solution? Uh, the solution is the vector alpha equals, well, 1, negative 1 would be a good thing to use. That's the eigenvector. So this is the e-vector. How about lambda equals negative 1? Uh, let's give it a little more room. If lambda is negative 1, then here I put negative 1 minus 
negative 1. That makes 0. I'll write in the 0 because this is confusing. It's 0 times a1, and the next coefficient is 2a2, is 0. People sometimes go bananas over this, in spite of the fact this is the easiest possible case you can get. So I guess if they go bananas over it, it proves it's not all that easy, but uh, it is easy. Uh, so what's now the eigenvector that goes with this? Well, this term isn't there. It's 0. So the equation says that a2 has to be 0. And it doesn't say anything about a1, so let's make it 1. OK, now, out of this data, the final step is to make the general solution. What is it? x, y equals, well, a constant times the first normal mode, the solution constructed from the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. So that's going to be 1, negative 1, e to the minus 3t. And then the other normal mode times an arbitrary constant will be 1, 0 times e to the negative t. The lambda is it's this factor which produces uh, that, of course. Now, one way of looking at it is, first of all, get clearly in your head this is a pair of parametric equations, just like what you studied in 1802. Let's write them out explicitly, just this once. x equals c1 times e to the negative 3t plus c2 times e to the negative t. And what's y? y is equal to minus c1 e to the minus 3t and plus 0, so I can stop there. So in some sense, all I am asking you to do is plot that curve in the xy plane. Plot the curve given by this pair of parametric equations. And you can choose your own values of c1, c2, but I'll try to plot, see what, for different values of c1 and c2, there'll be different curves. Give me a feeling for what they all look like. Well. I think most of you will recognize you didn't have stuff like this. Uh, these weren't the kind of curves you plotted in part where you did parametric equations in 1802. You did stuff like x equals cosine t, y equals sine t. Everybody knows how to do that. Uh, a, a few other curves which made lines or nice things, but nothing that ever looked like that. And so the computer will plot it by actually calculating values, uh, but of course we will not. That's the significance of the word sketch. I'm not asking you to plot carefully, but to give me some general geometric picture of what these, all these curves look like without doing any work. Without doing any work. OK. Well, that sounds promising. OK, let's try to do it without doing any work. Where shall I begin? Begin. Hidden in that, hidden in this formula are four solutions which are extremely easy to plot. So begin with the four easy solutions. And then fill in the rest. Now which are the easy solutions? The easy solutions are c1 equals plus or minus 1, c2 equals 0, or c1 equals 0, c2 equals plus or minus 1. That gives me 4. By choosing those four values of c1 and c2, I get simple solutions corresponding to the normal modes. See, if c1 is 1 and c2 is 0, I'm talking about 1, negative 1, e to the minus 3t. And that's very easy to plot. So let's start plotting them. What I'm going to do is color code them, color code them so you'll be able to recognize what it is I'm plotting from what, uh, uh, so let's see what colors should we use. We'll use pink and uh, orange. Okay. So this will be our pink solution, and our orange solution will be this one. Let's plot the pink solution first. So the pink solution corresponds to c1 equals 1 and c2 equals 0. 
Now, that solution looks like, uh, let's, write, let's write it in pink. No, let's not write it in pink. What is the solution? It looks like x equals e to the negative 3t, y equals minus e to the minus 3t. Well, that's not a good way to look at it, actually. The best way to look at it is to start to say at t equals 0, where is it? It's at the point 1, negative 1. And what is it doing as t increases? Well, it keeps this di the direction, it, but it travels. The, the amplitude, the distance from the origin keeps shrinking. As t increases, this factor, so it, it's, it's the tip of this vector, except the vector is shrinking. It's still in the direction of 1, negative 1, but it's shrinking in length because the, its uh, amplitude is shrinking according to the law e to the negative 3t. In other words, this curve looks like this. At t equals 0, it is over here. And as it goes along this diagonal line until as t equals infinity, gets to infinity, it reaches the origin. Of course, it never gets there. So if you watch, it's go, it goes slower and slower and slower in order that it may never reach the origin. What was it doing for t values of t less than 0? The same thing, except it was further away. So it comes in from infinity along, along that straight line. In other words, the eigenvector determines the line on which it travels, and the eigenvalue determines which way it goes. If the eigenvalue is negative, it's approaching the origin as t increases. How about the other one? Well, uh, if c1 is negative 1, then everything is the same, except it's the mirror image of this one. If c1 is negative 1, then at t equals 0, it's at this point. And once again, the same reasoning shows that it's coming into the origin as t increases. So I have now two solutions, this one corresponding to c1 equals 1, and the other one, c2 is 0. This one corresponds to c1 equals negative 1. OK, how about the other guy, the orange guy? Well, now c1 is 1, is 0. C2 is 1, let's say. So it's the vector 1, 0, but otherwise everything is the same. I start now at the point 1, 0 at time 0. And as t increases, I come into the origin, always along that direction. And before that, I came in from infinity. And again, if C2 is, so that's if C2 is 1. And if C2 is negative 1, I do the same thing, but on the other side. OK, that wasn't very hard. I plotted four solutions. And now I roll up my sleeves and wave my hands to try to get others. The general philosophy is the following. The general philosophy is that uh, the differential equation looks like this. It's a system of differential equations. These are continuous functions. That means when I draw the velocity field corresponding to that system of differential equations, because their functions are continuous, as I move from one x, y point to another, the direction of the velocity vectors changes continuously. It never suddenly reverses or does something like that. Now, if that changes continuously, then the trajectories must change continuously too. In other words, nearby trajectories should be doing approximately the same thing. Well, that means that the, all the other trajectories, since you know, ones which come like that, must be going also toward the origin. If I start here, probably I have to follow this one. I'm going to, so they're all coming to the origin. Uh, but that's a little too vague. Uh, how do they come to the origin? In other words, are they coming in straight like that? Probably not. Uh, then what are they doing? And now we're coming to the only point in the lecture which you might find a little difficult. Try to follow what I'm doing now. If you don't follow, I wrote it. It's not well done in the textbook, uh, but it is very well done in the notes because I wrote them myself. And so please, it's done very carefully in the notes. Patiently follow through the explanation. It takes about that much space. Uh, it's, but it's one of the important, 
it's one of the important ideas that uh, your engineering professors will expect you to understand. Anyway, I know this only from the negative one because they say to me at lunch, ruin my lunch, <laughs> but I say, you know, I gave my, said my students, you know, I got nothing but blank looks, you know, what do you guys teach them over there, blah, 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 blah. Maybe we ought to start teaching it ourselves. You know, sure, why don't they start cutting their own hair, too? Uh, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, here's the idea. Let, let me recopy that solution. So the solution looks like 1, negative 1, e to the minus 3t, uh, plus c2, 1, 0. Uh, e to the uh, t, negative t. What I ask is, as t goes to infinity, I feel sure that the trajectories must be coming into the origin because these guys are doing that. And in fact, that's confirmed. As t goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and that goes to zero regardless of what the c1 and c2 are. So that makes it clear that this goes to zero no matter what the c1 and c2 are, as t goes to infinity. But I'd like to analyze it a little more carefully. As t goes to infinity, I have the sum of two terms. And what I ask is, which term is dominant? Of these two terms, are they of equal importance, or is one more important than the other? When t is 10, for example, that's not very far on the way to infinity, but it's certainly far enough to illustrate. Well, e to the minus 10 is an extremely small number. The only thing smaller is e to the minus 30. The term that dominates, they're both small, but relatively speaking, this one is much larger because this one only has a factor e to the minus 10, whereas this has a factor e to the minus 30 which is a, you know, vanishingly small. In other words, as t goes to infinity, well, let's write it the other way. This is the dominant term as t goes to infinity. Now, just the opposite is true as t goes to minus infinity. t going to minus infinity means I'm backing up along these curves. As t goes to minus infinity, you know, let's say t gets to be uh, 100, minus 100, negative 100, then this is e to the 100, but this is e to the 300, which is much, much, much bigger. So this is the dominant term as t goes to negative infinity. Now what I have is the sum of two vectors. Let's first look at what happens as t goes to infinity. As t goes to infinity, I have the sum of two vectors. This one is completely negligible compared with the one on the right-hand side. In other words, for all intents and purposes, as t goes to infinity, it's this thing that takes over. Therefore, what does a solution look like as t goes to infinity, the answer is it follows the yellow line. Now, what does it look like as it backs up? As, t, as it came in from negative infinity, what does it look like? Now, this one's a little harder to see. This is big, but this is infinitely bigger. I mean, very, very, very much bigger when t is a large negative number. Therefore, what I have is the sum of a very big vector, okay, you're standing on the moon looking at the blackboard, so this is a really big, okay? This is a very big vector. This is one million yards long, a million meters long, okay? And this is only 20,000 meters long. That's this guy, and that's this guy. Okay, I want the sum of those two. What does the sum look like? The answer is the sum is approximately parallel to the long guy because this is negligible. This doesn't mean they're next to each other, but they're like, like this. It's slightly tilted over, but not very much. 
So in other words, as t goes to a negative infinity, it doesn't coincide with this vector, the solution doesn't, but it is parallel to it, has the same direction. Okay, I'm done. It means far away from the origin, it should be parallel to the pink line. Near the origin, it should turn and become more or less coincident with the orange line. And those were the solutions. That's how they look. How about down here? Same thing. Like that, but then after a while, they turn and join. Here, they have to turn around to join up, but they join. And that's, in a simple way, the sketches of those functions. That's, that's how they must look. Uh, so what does this say about our uh, state? Well, it says that uh, the fact that the governor of New Hampshire is indifferent to what Massachusetts doing produces ultimately harmony. Both states revert ultimately to their normal advertising budgets, in spite of the fact that Massachusetts is keeping an eye peeled out for the slightest misbehavior on the part of New Hampshire. Peace reigns, in other words. Okay, uh, now you should know some names. Uh, let's see, I'll write names in purple. There are two words that are used to describe this situation. First is the word which describes the general pattern of the way these lines look. Uh, it's called, that's the word for that is a node. And the fact that all the trajectories end up at the origin, uh, for that one uses the word sink. Uh, this could be modified to nodal sink would be better. Nodal sink, let's say. Nodal sink or sink, if you like to write them in the opposite order, sink node. In the same way, there would be something called a source node if I reversed all the arrows. I'm not going to calculate an example. Uh, why don't I uh, would simply do it by giving you, uh, for example, uh, if, if the matrix A produced a solution which looked like x equals, uh, instead of that one, Suppose it looked like 1, negative 1, e to the uh, 3t. The eigenvalues were reversed, were now positive. And I'll make the other one positive too. c2, uh, 1, 0, e to the t. What would the change in the picture? The answer is essentially nothing except the direction of the arrows. In other words, the first thing would still be 1, negative 1. The only difference is that now as t increases, we go the other way. And here, the same thing. Oh, we have still the same basic vector, the same basic orange vector, orange line, but it's now traversed the solution. We traverse it in the opposite direction. Okay, now, let's analyze, make the same thing about dominance as we did before. Which term dominates as t goes to infinity? This is the dominant term. Because as t goes to infinity, 3t is much bigger than t. This one, on the other hand, dominates as t goes to negative infinity. So how now will the solutions look like? Well, as t goes to infinity, they follow the pink curve, whereas t is, starts out from negative infinity, they follow the orange curve. So, so, they, uh, as t goes to infinity, they, uh, They become parallel to the pink curve, and as t goes to negative infinity, they're very close to the origin and are following the yellow curve. The, so this is pink, and this is uh, yellow. So they look like this.
Notice the picture basically is the same. It's still the pictures are, it's the picture of a node. All that's happened is the arrows are reversed, and therefore this would be called a nodal source. The word source and sing correspond to what you learned in 1802 and 802, I hope also. Uh, or you could call it a source node. Both phrases are used, uh, depending on your, how you want to use it in a sentence. And um, this, another word for this is, this would be called unstable because all of the solutions, no matter starting out from near the origin, ultimately end up at infinity, end up infinitely far away from the origin. This would be called stable. In fact, it would be called asymptotically stable. I don't like the word asymptotically, but it's become standard in the literature. And more important, it's standard in your textbook. And I don't like to fight with a textbook. It just ends up confusing everybody, including me. OK, uh, that's enough for nodes. Uh, I'd like to talk now about some of the other cases that can occur, uh, because they lead to completely different pictures, which you should understand. So let's look at the case. Uh, uh, where our uh, governors are, uh, behave a little more badly, a little more combatively, combatively, or I don't know, whatever the word is. <laughs> okay, so it's x prime equals negative 1, negative x, as before, but this time a firm response by Massachusetts to any sign of increased activity by... Uh, stockpiling of advertising budgets. So here it will be, let's say, uh, New Hampshire now is even worse. Five times we will quintuple whatever uh, increase Massachusetts makes. We are not a, of course they don't have an income tax, but they, I don't know, they'll manage. Minus three Y as before. Okay, what now is, uh, Let's again calculate quickly what the characteristic equation is. So our matrix is now negative 1, 3, 5, and negative 3. The characteristic equation now is lambda squared. What is that? Uh, again, plus 4 lambda. But now the determinant is 3 minus 15 is negative 12. And this, uh, because I prepared very carefully, all eigenvalues are integers. And so this factors into lambda uh, plus 6 times lambda minus 2. Does it not? Uh, yes. Right? 6 minus 12, 6 lambda minus 2 lambda, 4 lambda. Good. So what do we got? Well, first of all, we have our eigenvalue lambda negative 6. And the eigenvector that goes with that is minus 1. So this is negative 1 minus negative 6 makes, shut your eyes, 5. So it, we get 5a1 plus 3a2 is 0. And I, the other equation, I ho hope it comes out to be something similar. I didn't check. I'm hoping this is right. So uh, the eigenvalue, the eigenvector is, OK, now you've been taught to always make one of them one. Forget about that. Just pick numbers which make it come out right. So, uh, so I'm going to make this one 3, and then I'll make this one negative 5. As I say, I have a, a policy of integers only. I'm a number theorist at heart. That's how I started out life anyway. OK. Uh, so there we've got a data from which we can make one solution. How about the other one? The other one will correspond to the eigenvalue lambda equals 2. And this time, the equation is negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So it's minus 3a1 plus 3a2 is 0. And now the eigenvector is 1, 1. OK, now we're ready to uh, draw pictures. We're going to make the similar analysis, but it'll go faster now because uh, you've already had the experience of that. So uh, first of all, uh, what's our general solution? It's going to be C1 times 3, negative 5, e to the minus 6t. 
And then the other normal mode will be times an arbitrary constant will be 1, 1 times e to the 2t. I'm going to use the same strategy. We've got our two normal modes here from which the eigenvalue solutions, eigenvalue eigenvector solutions, uh, from which by ch adjusting these constants we can get our four basic solutions. So those are going to look like, uh, let's draw a picture here. And again, I'll color code them. Uh, let's uh, use pink again. Pink, orange. OK, so the pink solution now starts at 3, negative 5. That's where it is when t is 0. And because of the coefficient minus 6 up there, it's coming into the origin. Looks like that. And its mirror image, of course, does the same thing. That's when C1 is negative 1. How about uh, the orange guy? Well, the orange guy now, when t is equal to 0, it's at 1, 1. But what's it doing after that? As t increases, it's getting further away from the origin because the sign here is positive. e to the 2t is increasing. It's not decreasing anymore. So this guy is going out. And its mirror image on the other side is doing the same thing. Now, uh, now what we have to do is fill in the picture. Well, you fill it in by continuity. The tra nearby trajectories must be doing what? similar thing. So if I start out very near the pink guy, I should stay near the pink guy, but as I get near the origin, I'm also approaching the orange guy. Well, there is no other possibility other than that. If you're further away, you start turning a little sooner. So I'm just using an argument from continuity to say the picture must be roughly filled out this way. Maybe not exactly. In fact, there are fine points, uh, and I'm going to ask you to do one of them on Friday uh, for the new problem set, even before the exam, God forbid. Uh, but I want you to get some ex a little more experience working with that linear phase portraits visual, because it's, I think, one of the best ones uh, this semester. You can learn a lot from it. So anyway, you're not done with it, but I hope you've at least looked at it by now. Uh, OK, that's what the picture looks like. Uh, first of all, what are we going to name this? In other words, if you just forget about the arrows, if you just look at the general way those uh, lines go, where have you seen this before? It, you saw this in 1802. What was the topic? You were plotting contour curves of functions. Were you not? What did you call, what did you call a, a contour curves that look, formed that pattern? A saddle point. You call this a saddle point because it was like a saddle, the center of a saddle, or it's like a mountain pass. Here you're going up the mountain, say, and here you're going down, the way the contour line is going down. And this is sort of a minimax point, a minimum, a maximum if you go in that direction, and a minimum if you go in that direction, say. So without the arrows on it, it's like a saddle point, and so the same word is used here. It's called a saddle. Uh, you don't use, you don't say point in the same way you don't say a nodal point. It's the whole picture, as it were, that's the saddle. You know, it's a saddle. It's not, there's the saddle. There's, you know, giddy up. This is where you sit. Uh, now, should I call it a source or a sink? I can't call it either because it's a sink along these lines. It's a source along those lines. And along the others, it starts out looking like a sink and then turns around and it starts acting like a source. So the words source and sink are not used for a saddle. The only word that's used is unstable because definitely it is unstable. If you start off exactly on the pink lines, you do end up at the origin. But if you start anywhere else, ever so close to a pink line, you think you're going to the origin, and then at the last minute, you're zooming off and out to infinity again. So this is a typical example of instability. Uh, only if you do the mathematically 
possible but physically impossible thing of starting out exactly on the pink line. Only then will you get to the origin. If you start out anywhere else, make the slightest error in measurement and get off the pink line, you end off at infinity. So what's the effect with our uh, uh, governors, our warlike governors, fighting for the tourist trade, willing to spend any amounts of money uh, to match, match and overmatch what their competitor in the nearby state is spending, uh, the answer is they all lose. They end up, since only the pot, since it's, the, it's mostly this section of the diagram that makes sense, what happens is they end up all spending an infinity of dollars and nobody gets any more tourists than anybody else. So this is a model of what not to do. Okay, I have one more model to show you. Uh, <clears throat> My last model, uh, maybe we better uh, start over, do this board here. Let's see, Massachusetts on top, New Hampshire on the bottom. Okay, so X prime is going to be, so that's uh, Massachusetts is, uh, I guess as before, uh, let me get the numbers right. Okay. Leave that off for a moment. Y prime is uh, 2 X minus 3 uh, Y. So uh, New Hampshire behaves normally. Normally, it you know, was ready to respond to anything Massachusetts can put out, uh, but by itself, it really wants to bring its budget to normal. Now, Massachusetts, what do we have a Mormon governor now, I guess? Okay, uh, imagine instead we have a Buddhist governor. Uh, a Buddhist governor says, reacts as follows, uh, minus y. What does that mean? It means that when he sees New Hampshire increasing the budget, his reaction is, we will lower ours. We will show them, we will show them love. Uh, okay, this, it looks suicidal, but what actually happens? Well, uh, our little program, as ever, so our matrix A is negative one, negative one, two, negative three. Uh, the characteristic equation is lambda squared plus four lambda. And now what's the other term? Three minus negative two makes five. Okay, uh, this isn't going to factor because I tried it out and I know it's not going to factor. So we're gonna get three equals, lambda equals, we'll just use the quadratic formula, negative four plus or minus the square root of 16 minus four times five, that's 16 minus 20, or negative four, all divided by two, which makes minus two, uh, pull out the four, that makes it a two, cancels this two, minus one inside, so it's minus two plus or minus i. Complex solutions, now, agoo. what are we gonna do about that? Well, the thing, you should rejoice when you get this case and are asked to sketch it, uh, because even if you calculate the complex eigenvector, and from that take its real and imaginary parts for to make of the solutions of the complex solution, in fact, you will not be able easily to sketch the answer anyway. But let me show you what sort of a thing you can get, and then I'm going to wave my hands and argue a little bit to try to indicate what it is the solution actually looks like. So you're going to get something that looks like x, after you, a typical real solution is going to look like this. <clears throat> this is going to produce e to the minus 2t times e to the it, right? e to the minus 2 plus i all times t. This will be our exponential factor, which is shrinking in amplitude. This is going to give me sines and cosines. When I separate out the eigenvector into its real and imaginary parts, it's going to look something like this. A1A2 times cosine T, 
That's from the e to the it part. Then there'll be a sign term. And all that is going to be multiplied by the exponential factor e to the negative 2t. Now, that's just one, norm, that's just one normal mode. So it, it's going to be c1 times this plus c2 times something similar. It doesn't matter exactly what it is because they're all going to look the same. Namely, this is a shrinking amplitude. I'm not going to worry about that. My real question is, what does this look like? And the answer is, in other words, as a pair of parametric equations, if x is equal to a1 cosine t plus b1 sine t, and y is a2 cosine plus b2 sine, pair of parametric equations, what does it look like? Well, what is it? What are its characteristics? The first place, as a curve, this part of it is bounded. It stays within some large box because cosine and sine never get bigger than one and never get smaller than minus one. It's periodic. As t increases to t plus two pi, it comes back to exactly the same point it was at before. So we have a curve which is peri repeating itself periodically, does not go off to infinity, and here's where I'm waving my hands. It satisfies an equation. I'm going to leave those of you guys who like to fool around with mathematics a little bit. It's not difficult to show this, but it satisfies an equation of the form ax squared plus by squared plus cxy equals d. All you have to do is figure out what the coefficients a, b, and c, and d should be. And the way to do it is, if you calculate the square of x, you're going to get cosine squared, sine squared, and a cosine sine term. You're going to get those same three terms here and the same three terms here. You just use undetermined coefficients, set up a system of simultaneous equations, and you will be able to find the a, b, c, and d which work. OK, so I'm looking for a curve which is bounded, Period repeats, keeps repeating its values, and which satisfies a quadratic equation which looked like this. Well, these curves, uh, an earlier generation would know from high school, these are called conic sections. The only curves which satisfy equations like that are hyperbolas, parabolas, the conic sections, in other words, and ellipses. Uh, circles are a special kind of ellipses. There's a degenerate case, a pair of lines, which can be considered as a de degenerate hyperbola if you want. So it's sort of like a hyper, it's as much a hyperbola as a circle is an ellipse, say. OK, which of these is it? Well, must be those guys. Those are the only guys which stay bounded and which repeat themselves periodically. The other guys don't do that. These are ellipses. And therefore, what do they look like? Well, they must look like an ellipsis that's trying to be an ellipse, but each time it goes around, the point is pulled a little closer to the origin. It must be doing this, in other words. And this point, such a point, is called a spiral sink. Again, sink, because no matter where you start, you'll get a curve which spirals into the origin. Spiral is self-explanatory. And the one thing I haven't told you, which you must read, is how do you know that it goes around counterclockwise and not clockwise? Read clockwise or counterclockwise. I'll give you the answer in 30 seconds, uh, not for this particular curve that you'll have to calculate. But all you have to do is put in somewhere, let's say at the point 1, 0, a single vector from the velocity field. In other words, at the, po well, at the point 1, 0, when x is 1 and y is 0, our vector is minus 1, 2, which is the vector minus 1, 2. It goes like this. And therefore, the motion must be counterclockwise. And by the way, what's the effect of having a Buddhist governor? Peace. <laughs>
everything spirals into the origin and everybody is left with the same advertising budget they always had. Thanks.